Now let's talk with William Williman. Will, thank you for joining us again today. It's great to be it's, back. It's a very provocative message you just delivered for us, I think. And uh, I, I wonder if we can talk about this, the idea of seekers. Uh, well, you know, more. the ideas were Jesus, they were not original with me, but uh, all right. Uh, go I'll, ahead. I'll give you that. <laughs> I, I love this idea that, that we're not the ones that are seeking, that God is more of the seeker. What has been your experience with those folks that are coming into church or back to church for the first time, thinking that they're supposed to do all the work and maybe coming finally to a place where they realize it's more about God accepting them. I, I guess I, I treasure those people. I wish my churches had more of them because I think the stories that many of them have to tell are really a, a, a kind of validation of a living, active God. I, I fear that much of us in North American church are kind of in the grip of a, of a kind of deism uh, that was the faith of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington and all. The God is a great clockmaker that set up this wonderful world and then left and uh, doesn't intrude very often. And one of the things I loved about being a college chaplain at Duke was that you get to hear these stories by these students who are just minding their own business, walking innocently along, and then bam, they felt they heard their name called, they were summoned to something that was not their idea. And I think that's much close to the image of God that, that Jesus delivers. Will, how many times in your long career, in your own pilgrimage, have you looked over your own shoulder and felt God's hand uh, <laughs> uh, pulling at your shirt? Well, uh, Many times, well, I'll say enough to keep me at ministry for 40 years. I've had these wonderful moments in ministry when I just wanted to throw in the towel and was depressed and disgusted and this is all crazy and what are we doing trying to have a church in this neighborhood anyway. And uh, it, it seemed to me just right then something came my way, often a, an act of fidelity by a layperson that was so undeniable and real that it was almost like God was just saying to me, now look at that. Now, now, are you going to tell me that's not miraculous? That's not spectacular? Look at that. Let me hear you say it. So, so I, I'm thankful. I, again, it's a great comfort in the Christian faith to realize that, in a sense, my relationship to God is, is God's self-assignment, God's problem, and not my earnest efforts and all. So... I love those moments where God just kind of cuts through and gets to us. But aren't you also saying that we're called to follow that example, that we should also be seekers, we should also search out others who need help. That's great. <laughs> who are I, lost. I, I, I sometimes wonder if so many of the churches that I serve uh, have people who have been, if they've been found, they were found a long time ago and they're content and just happy as they can be being Methodist. Um, I, I say we, we've got the test of a church is how many people are there that are, uh, that, that are lost and being found. Uh, that I, I was in a very unorthodox Methodist church a couple weeks ago, meets in a former grocery store called Genesis, it's a church for people that feel uncomfortable at church. Hmm. Well, during the service, uh, my wife and I are sitting there, and the pastor, a talented uh, woman, uh, said, uh, was talking about when Al-Anon met and when AA met during the week. So uh, the minister said, uh, let me see, how many of you are addicted to drugs or alcohol? Let's see the hands. And my wife Patsy said, are we allowed to ask that? I, I've never heard that during the church announcements. All these hands went up. Then the pastor said, uh, I know some of you have trouble believing in the Christian faith. Can you read about some strange things in the Bible, people walking on water and everything? Uh, well, if you need some help, every hand being held up here is a miracle that God created. And just look at these people. They are your proof, your evidence. Now put down your hands. Well, I just thought that, now that, that's a church that kind of gives resonance with the gospel in a beautiful way. Well, I know you're a prolific writer and a voracious reader as well. I'm curious what you're noticing happening in, in the Christian 
culture right now. There's lots of shifts going on. What's speaking to you in a really interesting way, the things that you look at and read oh, about? Oh, I guess today <laughs> I'm interested in what I can understand of the emerging church, the emergent church, the church of the 20, 30-somethings, uh, those that my church has real trouble reaching and attracting and seeking and keeping. And what, what, what do you mean by that? The, the emergent church, church okay. I think of is a kind of new uh, movement uh, in very diverse forms uh, of people who are not happy with the theological options we've given them of evangelicalism over here or spent liberalism over there. Uh, they, uh, I, I know I have a church that uh, is, uh, they sing contemporary Christian music. It has a kind of rock sound. But then they have communion, uh, the Eucharist, every Sunday. Uh, they sit around in easy chairs and sofas and for the sermon uh, the preacher starts them out and tells them what he thinks and then he throws it open and everybody else joins into it and that's the sermon. Um, it, wow, uh, some of that kind of frightens me, but I'm, I'm Why older. Why does that frighten you? <laughs> oh, well, I just... I mean, I know churches where you're overdressed in jeans and sandals. Uh, what, yeah, why does yeah, that I've got you? churches like that. Well, notice I'm not in jeans and sandals. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, you know, uh, when I kind of complained about the sermon in one of these churches, uh, <laughs> one of the late leaders, who's 26 years old, said to me, uh, you clergy really get scared when we get into the act of biblical interpretation, don't you? You think you own that, don't you? And I said, thank you, kid. Thank you. <laughs> so it, I think it's a generational difference. I'm, I'm so interested because I love to see these congregations that take very seriously the challenge of reaching a new generation. I can picture I, your new generation. I can picture your two-year-old grandson, Will, named uh, for yeah. you, who just recently... <laughs> ask you what you did. Tell the story. <laughs> well, he was asking me what I did. He said he wanted to be an astronaut. And I said, well, I don't do that. I'm a Methodist preacher. And he said, you are a Methodist preacher? And I said, yeah. And I have a degree, too. And <laughs> I, I've got a certificate certifying me as one. Why do you ask? And he said, well, I just, just didn't know that. He said, I've never been able to tell. <laughs> and uh, uh, boy, out of the mouth of babes. Uh, and uh, How do you talk to God about, you know, to, to Will? I mean, what is the language that you use with your grandchildren these days? Well, I hope, I hope I will practice the faith and his parents will practice the faith in such a way that he will grow up wanting to embrace that. I think that's kind of the most way a lot of people become Christians. I think I also, apropos of my message, uh, I have faith that God wants him and that God will find a way to get to him. And uh, again, as a college chaplain for 20 years, I love these stories about people who've expended a lot of intellectual energy avoiding God, only to have God show up in their lives at the most inopportune time and the weirdest place. And I love to hear these strange stories. And so uh, I think I have faith that Jesus Christ really does want to reach the whole world. And he died for the sins of the whole world. And that this is part of his sort of move into the world and on the world. Well, it's always a great pleasure to have you with well, us today. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us.